first people came in 1844, 1845. And there were two families that came about the same time. And what happened was that these Dutch uh, immigrants from that particular time in, in, in human history, you know, the Dutch settled in New York City and they settled Albany and Schenectady and all those areas up and down the Hudson. But this was the second wave and they came in the middle of the 19th century and they got to New York and then there were, there were Dutch entrepreneurs, I guess, that had boats that met them at Fire Island and directed them what to do when they got uh, in, in New York City and went through customs or whatever it was in the middle of the 19th century. And there was a group there that sent them to western New York where there was something called the Holland Land Company. And there was a representative of the Holland Land Company that lived in Westfield, his name was Daniel Patterson, he eventually was a lieutenant governor of the state of New York. And Patterson would meet these people that were coming from the Netherlands and direct them where to go in western New York where there was property available. And so Patterson met these original families and Esslink was one, Warren's House was another, and then there were later families that came like my own and like uh, Beckerink. And, and if you look at the town of Winterswijk now on a map, Winterswijk is again in Helderland, it's in the southeast part of the Netherlands, it's an area called the Octorhook, behind the corner is the way it translates out in the sticks is the way the Dutchman would say. Okay, so this little town is out in the sticks. If you look around that little town, all the names, that, most of the names you find in Clymer, Arnick, Bensink, Wasink, uh, you know, you name them, all own farms. And they're identified on the map now. And if you pick up a, a map of Winterswijk uh, on Wikipedia, for instance. Winterswijk now is a town that's about the size of Jamestown, maybe a little bit smaller. But the general area around it, all these farms still are identified in the current map. So roads are built, they can get eventually to Rotterdam. Rotterdam, they go to New York. New York, they go up the Hudson River, then across the Erie Canal, get into Lake Erie, and then they run out of money, which is why they end up in Clymer. If they really had enough money, they'd go west, <coughs> and some went to Holland, Michigan, <coughs> excuse me, but others went to Sheboygan and that area in Wisconsin. So uh, when these guys could, you know, basically they were poor farmers, most of them, and it was really economics that forced them to leave the old country. And when I was a boy, it was called the old country. There were people around who were sons of immigrants or were themselves immigrants. I never heard Dutch and Clymer, but my grandparents spoke it. Um, and the letters that I have from my grandfather to his father and back and forth, uh, when he was a student, my grandfather was a student in Northwest Iowa uh, at a small school called now Northwestern College, but he was Northwestern Academy at the time. And the letters that he had back and forth with his father and his sisters, the sisters' letters were in English, but the father and mother wrote to him in Dutch and vice versa. There were services in the Clymer Church in Dutch until about 1930. Now, that's all a way of saying is that these were rural people who really could own land. And the reason Patterson liked them, he's the Holland land guy, the reason Patterson liked them was because the Hollanders were hardworking. Mm -hmm. And so they had that reputation and so they went to Clymer and they did some wonderful things over the years, but it took a while. So now my family, the Neckers family, now the Essex came in 1844. The guy had seven kids, two, three I think came with him, were born in Winterswijk. But the other four were born here and the two boys, one was killed in the Civil War as I said. And the other uh, was uh, sickly and died, but the girls all survived. And so they got here around 1844 and then they, they did some basically um, homesteading. So they homesteaded property on the Clymer Sherman Road, north of Clymer, then toward Clymer Hill, and eventually ended up almost exactly where Marion Beckerink's father-in-law lives now, in what we would call, I don't know, I, I, it has a name, but I don't remember, but Jaquins, that sort of area. Mm -hmm. Jaquins has a Jackson Center connection, or more a Jackson connection, because if you know where Marion's father-in-law lives, you come around the corner, 
Ford climber, and the first left goes to an area called Jaquins. And that area is where there's a drain for something called Broken Straw Creek. And when I was a boy, young boy, there was a dam across Broken Straw Creek, and I've got all sorts of pictures of it that I took with one of the interns here. Uh, a dam across Broken Straw Creek that Garrett Tempest, does that name anything to you? That Garrett Tempest built an electric plant called the Climber Electric Company, and he put that beyond the dam so the spill water would then turn the, the uh, uh, condenser I guess I don't know what it would turn I'm not a physicist anyway it turned the thingamabob and you got electricity out of it this was 1916 or so and somewhere in my files I have uh, the the uh, information in Mayville where it talks about the um, founding of the climber electric company I'm not sure what those are called but you know incorporation baby. yeah incorporation baby and uh, so this was G.H. Tempest and his wife, and they dammed up that creek, and then they had this spill that they used. That, now, what happened by the mid-1920s is that land on the side of the creek toward the electric company was owned by a farmer, and his name was, I can't remember, but I can find it out, owned by a farmer. So there's, and I'm going to refer back to Bill Renskers. You remember interviewing yeah, Bill yeah, Renskers? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Bill's father worked for the electric company. Uh, his name was Ray. So Ray Renskers, Bill's father, worked for the Climber Electric Company. And down Broken Stalk Creek, after it passes over the, the, the spill, um, was some land on the side of the creek where up the side, that same side of the creek, was a lumber mill owned by an Ernest Calflish. Okay, now Ernest Kaflish is, Jim Kaflish is now, I guess it's, uh, his, he's in the county government someplace. Jim Kaflish is great-grandfather. Okay. Now Ernest Kaflish wasn't too swift. Mm -hmm. He wasn't very sharp tack in the drawer. Because he moved to Climber from Rochester where he was employed and worked with this crazy guy by the name of uh, Eastman who was developing something called well, the story is he worked for George Eastman. He said, I can make better money cutting down trees than Climber. <laughs> and so Jim told me this himself. And so he moved to Climber, and that's where he set up his lumber mill. Wow. Now, he wanted to use the water that was in Broken Straw Creek to get logs from the other side of the creek to his lumber mill. And so he bought some property from this farmer who I think his name was Gross, but I don't remember for sure. So he bought some property from this farmer, and the property then, you know, showed up in uh, a, a quite interesting way later on because the farmer either went broke and died or died and his family went broke. And the bank, which my grandfather was the president of, foreclosed on the farmer. Now, Calflish had bought $300 worth of that land to protect himself from Tempest, and so he wanted to say to Tempest, now you gotta knock the dam down because I own part of the property down the, down the, down the creek. <laughs> but he forgot to get a deed, or he didn't get a deed, or he didn't know enough to get a deed. And uh, so as a result, uh, he sued Tempest and he sued the bank. And you know, after they foreclosed, so Tempest sued the bank my grandfather was president of the bank. He hired Jackson. Jackson defended the case, said you don't have a deed, and that was the first case that Jackson won in the New York Court of Appeals, 1929, okay? Um, after that, um, so the bank was founded, the Clymer Bank was founded in 1910, and there were seven original shareholders. My grandfather was one. There was a guy by the name of George Gross who was not the farmer. There was another guy by the name of Lakers, and then John Neckers, who was the first owner of Neckers Company, was one of the four, uh, one of the seven. And Ernest Catholic was too. Okay, so these were owners of the Climber Bank from the point of view of founders, and they had founder stock and all that sort of stuff. 1933, Roosevelt closed the banks. Climber Bank was was a Climber State Bank. 
And my grandfather went to Jackson in his home on Fairmount Avenue. And when my dad was there, so he told me this story, I asked him to help him, and Jackson said, I can't do anything, you've got to go home and reorganize. So they reorganized. My grandfather stayed on the board, but Garrett Tempest became the president after that. And all those records are lost. So I don't have any records from 1933 backward. We've got records from 33 forward, okay? So anyway, the climber people were very enterprising. They started a bank, they started an electric company, they started a water company, they started a telephone company. All in the period 1900, 1910 to 1920. These were the second generation climbers. I mean, so the first generation came, eked out a living, Boo Neckers, you know Boo Neckers? Harold Neckers, he owns Neckers. Well, he's, he's the oldest of the people that own Neckers Company now. Okay. His son runs it. Harold Boo Neckers told me that his grandfather uh, was second oldest in the family of 11 Neckers that were Albert Neckers Sr.'s children. And he told me that the oldest sister and his grandfather had one pair of shoes between them so that one would go to school one day with the shoes and the other would go to school the next day with the shoes. But they made it. You know, they had one cow or two cows and they survived and then the children, all the children of that 11, of the, all the 11 children of that family survived to adulthood. Yeah. Um, some of them, most of them lived into their late 70s, early 80s. Uh, all but two continued to live in, well, that's not true. There was a suicide in the family. That's, I forgot that. But all but two lived in Climber for their whole lives. Um, one moved to California and her daughter married a jeweler and became sufficiently wealthy so that her um, her uh, estate was significant enough that they gave money to Southern Illinois where my uncle was chairman of the chemistry department and there's now still a Necker's lecture okay. at that place because of Mildred, whatever her name was, Stein, I think, um, of her will. Another, the other one, uh, one, of my, one of the sisters that was closest to my grandfather in age became a, a nurse and lived in Buffalo. But the rest of them all stayed in the climber area for their whole lives. And uh, I'm trying to think if there would be any others known here other than the, the Necker's Company group, but I don't think so. One of them had a son-in-law that worked for Sears Roebuck. Wasn't there a Sears and Roebuck in Jamestown? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so he worked for that, but uh, that's about it. Now that's the Necker's side. The well, let's talk about your, just yeah. the name names for yeah. your kids. Yeah. Your grandfather was who? My great-grandfather was Albert Sr. My grandfather was Albert Jr. He was sixth of 11. And Albert Jr. was the tallest of all of the, all of the family. And he managed to, well, let's talk about a little bit more about climbers. So there were these families that came, uh, S-Link on the one hand and Warren's House on the other, and they founded a church and the church uh, was in Clymer. Well, there were two churches, one on Clymer Hill and the other in Clymer Village. Um, and Warren's House, the first 1844 Warren's House that came, brought three kids with him and had four or five after that. One of them became, um, went to Hope College, graduated around 1868 or something, or 67. Then he went to a seminary on the Rutgers University campus called New Brunswick Seminary and was educated there and then started moving around the state of New York taking church jobs at various places. By the end of 18, the 1870s, his father had convinced him, his name was John Henry Quornshouse, his father had convinced him to come back to Clymer because the church still, which is on the same spot that Abbey Reformed Church is today, um, his father had convinced him to come back and try and help the church get solvent because it was in the sheriff's hands. They were bankrupt. So he did that and he was an incredibly energetic uh, 
He was an entrepreneur, basically. And so he came back to Clymer, and he, I think about 1877, I can check this because there's a history written of the Clymer Church, but anyway, around 1876 or seven, he came back to Clymer and he said, well, I know some people in west, eastern New York. I'll go see if some of them can help us fund what's, what's the residue of a, of a Dutch community in the west. The east being New York City and Schenectady and Albany and all those places. Well, now they're in the west. So um, the west being originally western New York, but also Holland, Michigan was very far west. So that was, so anyway. And so he convinced a woman in New York, in Albany, by the name of Mrs. Livingston Abbey, and her first name, Margaret, I think, to give the Clymer Church about $2,800. And so he came home with $2,800, and he said to Mrs. Livingston Abbey, Mrs. Margaret Livingston Abbey, uh, so now we'll name the church after you. So in 1878 or 1879, because of this donation, they named it Abbey Reformed Church, which it still is. So Abbey Reformed Church, 1878, 1879, he was so happy. He had a son that was born right at the same time. And he said, I'll name that son Livingston Warren's House, or Abbey Livingston Warren's House, or whatever, but you know, those names, right? Mrs. Abbey said, that's okay, but I want him to be named by my name, not my husband's name. Mm -hmm. So he became A. Livingston Warren's house. And he and my grandfather weren't the same age, they were close, but they were very, they were very close friends. So Warren's house, the preacher, 1880, finishes his tenure, and I've got the baptismal records. The church records were lost uh, before Warren's House came, but then Warren's House kept church, church records. So I've got the church records that talk about the baptism of the children after my grandfather and his brother. So 1880, there was a pair of twins, and, and also Sarah, who was the one next to my grandfather. They were all baptized, and so I have those baptismal records. Before we don't, because the records were lost. So 1880 comes, and Warren's House moves to Northwest Iowa. And he moves to the town of, of, well, he moves to the town of Alton, and he starts a Reformed church there. Now you don't know where Alton, Iowa is. It's in the very northwest corner of the state. Again, you know, out in the boonies. These climber folks were happy with being in the boonies. Now the son of a climber folks in the boonies, and now he's in Iowa. He starts a church. And his son, A. Livingston, and my grandfather, Albert, were good friends. And so Albert was sent by my great-grandmother, his Warren's House sister, to northwestern Iowa to live with the Livingston, with the Warren's House family and go to school. And he went to school in a small uh, town of Orange City, which was close to Alton. And in Orange City, there was this Northwestern Academy. He went there studied from 1889 to 1890, then came back with funding from uh, patrons of that preachers, came back to Hope College and started studying there. So my grandfather had basically the beginnings of a college education before 1891, when he would have been 18 or 19, okay? Then he, and I have letters written to him by his uncle Warren's house, and letters written by his family to him when he's in Iowa. He got homesick and he was really, but uh, he and Livingston became very close friends. He came back to Clymer, had an awful hard time. And then in 1900, bought a store, kitty corner across from, from what is Necker's company. Oh. And that he bought with his brother, Frank. Frank and Albert Necker's formed something called Necker's Brothers. So you may remember, I don't know if you do or not, but there were stores next to the Clymer restaurant. With, okay, so that's, that was my grandfather and his brother's store. Well, so, so what was the store, what, what did it have? Everything. everything? Yeah, yeah um, and so it had groceries and it had uh, dry goods, they called them, everything. Chews, thread, you know, an awful day always. I hate New Year's Day because what I remember as a kid was doing inventory in that store. And as a little kid, I got to count the thread. Yeah. I couldn't do something so big as boots, but I could count thread. Anyway, so 
started the store. It became successful, so the first, um, the bank was started in 1910, and the first um, uh, patron, what everyone calls a bank, was Clymer's Necker's company, uh, Necker's Brothers, and uh, I think they said the first deposit was $20,000, which was a lot of money at that wow. time, okay? And then uh, Necker's company was founded by the older brother, John, in 1910. So they had two competing s stores across the street. Um, Frank started messing around with the little ladies, got caught, committed suicide in 1922. So maybe there are other stories around that I probably sh any relatives? Yeah, there are probably some. But anyway, <laughs> bottom line is that's the story. Um, anyway, so then Grandpa was owning the store himself. He changed the name to the Climber Department Store. And it stayed that way until my dad sold it in the early 60s. But so that, that was Albert. And he was extremely successful, and I have honored him with funding here. Yeah. Um, so Albert had, and this is, so Albert... Uh, 1891, now Alton Iowa, I need to go back to that because it's come back in my life. Arguably the most successful businessman in Toledo right now is the, I guess he's the CEO of ProMedica. So it's, you know, it's a health delivery agency and it's growing like mad. I mean, they're just buying up everything. His name is Randy Ostra and Randy's wife and Randy went to Northwestern College, and Randy Ostra's wife went to this church that my Uncle Warren's house in 1880 founded in Northwest Iowa, right? Wow. Randy Ostra is, I don't know what he's worth, but he's as successful as there is in the whole state of Ohio. He's that sort of entrepreneur. Anyway, so, and I keep saying to his wife, Barb, you know, you got to know something about your Alton Reformed Church. Of course, they're too busy to worry about the old days. But I have fun trying to needle them a little bit because some of the preachers along the line in that church uh, were fathers of college classmates of mine at Old College. And all of that, it continues, I guess. I guess the church is still there. All the time having Dutch connections. Yeah. Anyway, so Grandpa came back to Climber, started the store, or they started the bank, the electric company, and all that sort of stuff. And then, uh, um, well, the Depression hit. He lost it all, basically, and paid back. There wasn't some, such a thing as D&O insurance. Driving here this morning, I had a big discussion with my insurance agent about now how am I selling my business, how much directors and officers insurance do I need to keep carrying? And well, you need to keep it until you close the business now. But at that time, there wasn't such a thing. So the bank closed in 1933, the depositors lost whatever number, he paid them all back personally. And I remember when he told my uncle, Jim, that he had paid back all of these depositors and the last one he paid back, and I don't know who it was, but this was about 1953, 1954, something like that, okay? The honor, honor yeah, the really honor, nice. the distinguished honor. So anyway, Jim was the, the, so Albert came back and eventually in 1900 bought the store, bought a house that's still there on the main street in Clymer and got married. And he married uh, a, a woman by the name of Wasink Wassings came to Clymer later, so about 1870 or so. Um, some of the changes that were driving people out of the Netherlands, other parts, not necessarily the, the rural part, the winter spike, were changes that were being caused by changes in farming. So there are people, in the, one of whom is Winnie Hogenbaum. Remember Win, Winnie uh, Rayburg and remember Winnie Llewellyn? Sure. Okay, so Winnie's mother was a Hogenboom, high tree in Dutch. And the Hogenboom who came to the United States was forced off the farm because of the discovery of dyes by the German company, which eventually became BASF. And they discovered a dye that looked like madder root, a red. And so that put all the madder root farmers out of business, of which Hogenboom was one. 
they were farming matter root down around the Belgian border, so you know somewhere near Antwerp, but they were Dutch. And so what do you do? Well, you don't have a living anymore, so they left. But that sort of thing, the growth of the synthetic dye industry for one, the growth of different ways to grow crops, another, and just the general crowding that was in the Netherlands drove a lot of them out. Of course, they make the excuse, and probably it's a reasonable one, that there was religious persecution, and there probably was. But the real reason that they left was economic. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so they get to the Netherlands, uh, get to the United States, and then they have to figure out what to do next. So most of them became farmers here, but some of them became businessmen. And Albert so then started a store in 1900 and bought the store. The, the store was already there, one of the early the first Dutch that I could find who was, it was called supervisor, wasn't it? Township supervisor before the legislature. Right, okay. So his name was Slotboom, and he was the supervisor in Glamour from about 1870 to 1878 or something like that. But my grandfather bought John Slotboom's store and John Slotboom's um, house. And that was his store and his house for the rest of his life. So. And Harold Necker's boo is what we called him, remembers as do I how these stores operated. So you'd go into the store and you'd have a list that you wanted. And there would be a counter across the back. Do you remember any of this? Is yeah. this before your time? Okay. So there'd be a counter across the back of the store and there would be four or five guys or whatever standing there to wait on the customers. So boo and I conversed within the last month about waiting on the customers, and that's what it meant. So they'd come in and they'd have, and then what, what happened at the beginning of my, grand, of my grandfather's store, and I have all these records, is that they had something called day books in which they re would record every transaction. Mm -hmm. So every transaction was recorded you know, in this day book, and there was barter, so somebody bring in six dozen eggs and they'd trade that for whatever. Right. And there was, you know, sales of this and sales of something else. So anyway, my grandfather marries Jenny Wasink. Do you remember Rake Wasink? Yeah, I do. So Rake Wasink's father's sister. So that's, the, that's that connection. Ralph was another brother. So my friend Harold's father was a brother of Rake, and they both were sons and daughters of well, sons of a Wasink that was the brother of what would have been my Uncle Jim's mother. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, they marry in April of 1900. This is your, for the, for the camera, this yeah. is your grandparents. My, not my grandparents, my grandfather. Your, your grandfather. Yeah. Your grandfather so, all right, so my grandfather marries Jenny Wasink in April, maybe the 15th, I don't know exactly the date, of 1900. She gets pregnant, she has a baby, baby's a boy, born April 16th, 1902. April 18th, 1902, in this day book, which is the book that records the transactions that are going on in the store, there's a listing that says $25 Doc McRae birth. So April 18th, 1902, my grandfather pays the doctor who is at the birth of my uncle. April 20th, the mother dies. Mm. So the doc got there ahead of time. Yeah. So she dies, then my grandfather is with a small baby, uh, no wife, but he has relatives all over the community. <coughs> and one of the people that then it makes themselves available is the wife of the brother who is in the store with him. So my grandfather grows up in the home of this, um, this, this family, Neckers, and they live, remember Broken Straw Creek? Right. All right, on the other side of Broken Straw Creek, there's another Catholic who also is a lumberman. So over here is, is the Jim Catholic, Ernest Catholic, those guys, and on the other side is Lester Catholic, a brother. And that's where he bought the home of his mother-in-law who was named Neckers, okay? So 
her name was Anna Neckers, and she then took over raising my uncle with her daughter, who was just born, Laura, for the first two years. Now my my grandfather remarried, and that was the marriage to Dunawald, Hattie Dunawald, and that's me. Yeah. Okay, so that was exactly the same day that the wife before had given birth to Jim in two thousand in nineteen hundred nineteen two. In 1904, Hattie Dunwald and Albert Neckers marry. Okay, then my grandmother to be raises my f uncle, and then in 1912, my father is born. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now Jim, born 1902, goes to Clymer High School, and he's a member of the class of 1919, which means he's not eligible for the draft. So whereas Gilbert Tun who was Donna Tun Swanson's father, Marlia Tun, do Marlia, Marlia Brown? No. Okay, so Donna Tun, Gilbert Tun, her father, and Minnie is mother, and Clarence Raybergen, who is Winnie Llewellyn's father, were in the class of 1917. Both of them Clarence particularly was gassed. He was a member, <coughs> he was a, <coughs> he took care of horses. <coughs> and he was gassed in France, excuse me. <coughs> water. Yeah, thanks. Uh, he was gassed in France in 1917, I think. Well, no, it would have been 18. Yeah. And he died very, died very suddenly. And I think, <coughs> in all honesty, <coughs> I tried to confirm this with the death records in Clymer, but didn't. They said he died from a heart attack, but I suspect it was, you know, in part chlorine or mustard gas or something that caused, at least in part, his, uh, his early demise. He died very young. Anyway, those guys were two years older than my uncle. So my uncle graduates 1919. I have his valedictorian's address, by the way. So he graduates in 1919, goes to Hope College, he wanted to take physics because he was interested in electrochemistry or electro electricity, but they didn't teach physics the year he was there, so he took chemistry. And he then proceeded through Hope College and got a degree in chemistry, went to the University of Illinois and got a PhD. So he gets out of school in 1927, he wants to get a job, and he interviews at Hiram College in Ohio, and he interviews at Southern Illinois Normal School. And he, he, he's funny because he was, he was modest, but he wasn't. So the president of Hiram said, your salary for the first year will be $1,600. And he said, he looked at him, he said, you don't think much of PhDs around here, do you? And he turned the job down. <laughs> but he went to Southern Illinois um, Normal School. He was the second PhD hired at the school. And uh, this was 1927. And uh, there then was a president whose name was Shyrock. He's written his autobiography, by the way, or at least the autobiography of the chemistry department. And Shyrock determined about 1930 that every department head had to have the terminal degree in his field. So he, in 1930, was appointed head of the chemistry department, and he stayed in that position until he retired, mm. okay, in 1967 or 68. Um, he was on the... He was on the, uh, I liked him a lot. He was, he had uh, many of the traits that I had as an academic. He didn't suffer fools. Uh, he was nicer about it. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, so um, he, uh, at one point, um, there was a symposium going on at the University of Chicago and all the people had the same male area. And he told this story at graduation when he was 97, he got an honorary degree from Southern Illinois. So at in graduation, he told the story, he said, look, he said, all the guys were standing around the uh, mailbox and there was this symposium being taught by all PhDs and all these guys were standing around. All these PhDs, they don't know anything about teaching. <laughs> <laughs> Not a damn teacher of the whole bunch, right, of this symposium. So he was very proud of the fact that he had a PhD degree. And he worked at Illinois um, as a graduate student with a faculty member who was a Hope College alumnus. And I'll take that back in just a minute. But he was a Hope College alumnus and uh, 
uh, several of the Hope College students that went to Illinois in the 20s worked, and this guy's name was Kramers, and he left during the Depression and went to work for one of the steel companies in Cleveland. I don't know the actual name of it, but anyway, but, but m my uncle, and I have his the thesis at, in my office in Perrysburg, um, separated cerium from the other rare element. Now, there's, cerium has a, a really exciting history in some respects. Cerium was what's used in, in uh, lighter flints. So the guys in Bradford, Zippo, would know all about cerium. It's one of the rare earths. So there are a series of 14, I think, elements that are called rare earths, and they're really important in television uh, projections now. So the Chinese are cornering the market, and that's all part of what's going on with various things. Anyway, so he separated and isolated cerium, and, and Zippo used that for a while. But cerium had another very important uh, contribution. Uh, Pavel Nurm, what, what was the guy's name? The, the, um, uh, the Renner? Huh? No, not, that's Nermi. The, the Italian who was Pavel, Pavel, whatever. I'll think about it later. He was a chemist and a poet. And anyway, he, he saved his life. He was a Jew. He saved his life in the, I'll remember it and send it to you, but he saved, I've got his books at home. But he saved his life in the lab at Auschwitz because he recognized that this little bottle that had this gray stuff in it was cerium, and that was used in lighter flints. So he sold that to the SS for food. Um, okay, and and so he's written a book called Elements, and in this book Elements, he tells some of these stories. Uh, I'll have I'm a little tired, so I'll think about later. But anyway. So that was Sirium, and that was Jim's contribution as a research scientist in 1927. But his main claim, too, or his main claim at Southern Illinois, in addition to building the department, when he went there, the school was 1,500. When he left, it was 30,000. So a huge change over the... And he did things like change the name of the main street in town from Normal Street to University Avenue, those kinds of... Carbondale's out in the middle of really the coal country in southern Illinois. It's really a back, uh, backwoods kind of place. Um, and uh, he, he settled there and stayed there for his whole life and died there. So in, when he was 102, I think. But another thing that he did, and this is really interesting too, he served on the first, when he went to southern Illinois, he said that, uh, well, I, he told me the story often. He said, faculty member would teach until he died, and then the wife would get, the widow would get one month. And then she was on the kids or whatever. Right. And so he said the best duty he ever had was on a 10-member commission to write the Illinois State Reteach High Teachers Retirement uh, Fund in 1940. And he was retired for almost 40 years. So he retired when he was 65 and lived to 102. So he said that was a good duty. He got, more, got his money out of that one. Uh, but anyway, so then he was also a role model. He was a really important, uh, um, challenging role model. He'd come to Clymer every summer yeah. and uh, would spend a couple weeks with his father. His father, of course, raised him because his mother died. So they were very close. And uh, it was just a very nice relationship. Um, I'm going to think of that Pavel, whatever the heck his name is. I should know it, but I forgot. <laughs> anyway, so that was that was Jim, and then he. Uh, that was another interesting thing about Jim was, and all these things start to come together. So Jim, my dad, when he built his house in Climber, borrowed the money from Sam Tun. So Sam's Gilbert's father, Donna Swanson's grandfather. Well, how did Sam Tun have money? Well, he didn't put any money in the bank. He stuck his money under the mattress. So the Depression happened, he had money. So my grandfather knew that, and because Sam Tun was his brother-in-law, he sent my dad, when he needed money, to Sam to borrow money to build his house, okay? With Jim, what happened with him was, um, he, his wife, 
Jeanette Hoffman Neckers was from Holland, Michigan. They met at Hope College. Her father was an entrepreneur, but not the smartest. So he had mortgage, mortgage on a purchase of, I think, a half mile of Lake Michigan property. Half mile, okay? And so it comes time for the depression, it hits, and of course he, his business goes to pot, and he starts to lose this property. So Jim and his wife's brother buy two lots of 50 feet across, and whatever the depth was. And for that, they had to come up with some money. Well, Jim had a little bit, but he borrowed the money from the mother that raised him after his mother died, Anna Neckers, because her husband, Frank, committed suicide, and my grandfather knew that she didn't believe in banks either. So, and I've got the settlement, the, the, how much she, my grandfather paid that brother's widow like it was $50,000. Well, Grandpa knew that that money was under a mattress someplace. Jim borrowed it, saved 50 feet of property that his, he owned until he passed it on to his daughter. She owned until she's passing it on to her kids. And they all complained. I mean, my grandfather, my uncle complained while well, his daughter wasn't doing it right. And then the daughter complained because the kids are not doing it right. Now the kids are probably complaining because their kids are not doing yeah, it right. Yeah. But this lovely property on Lake Michigan, just a little bit north of Holland, they still own and they've made it into a, um, you know, full year-round home and they go there the whole year round. But, uh, you know, the, what came together was the fact that the aunt had all this money that grandpa had paid her to buy out her half of the climber store in 1924 or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, so they were doing well and then the depression hit and they did okay after that. But uh, it's all, you know, this isn't me. This is a history of, of, it's a really interesting history of what people had to go through to come here and survive. You know, the American dream, when the American dream meant something to to Dutchmen and Germans, not Russians and Chinese, you know? And so it was, it was, it was really, it was really interesting to trace that. Well, you know, just a, <coughs> a sidebar, you, you think of Clymer geographically, it's not on Chautauqua Lake, it's not on a river, it's not anything. It is farm country out in the middle of kind of sort of nowhere. And where was their market, Doug? What did they sell to themselves? Basically, work? yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the way that I'm going to have a, a I got to keep Hillary in, in uh, lozenges. Anyway, yeah, this is, this is interesting. So the way the store operated was that, so um, they had this system in which somebody would come in and they'd be waited on at the back. And so these were generally farmers from the area, okay? And they'd barter, so they'd bring things that the store needed. I don't think they ever took anything that was particularly like, well, my grandfather didn't sell meat. Lakers did that. But I think that, uh, you know, they'd take eggs and, and whatever. But um, the, 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 the protocol, the whole story was that the store was open five days a week, six really, mornings 7.30 to noon, but then Mondays, Tuesdays, and then Wednesdays it was open till 10, Thursdays till noon, Friday it was open till 5 or 5.30 or 6, Saturdays until 10. So what, you can add those hours up, they're 55 hours or so a week. And this was at a time, you know, I remember when they installed uh, um, fuel oil, I think, to heat the furnace. Before that, it was wood, so they heated it with wood and coal um, until, you know, after the war. Um, and the, the protocol would be that they were open Wednesday nights and then the farmers would bring lists from, from the area and come and talk around the, there were sheds over the front because that protected, that. well, first place it was a place for the horses to be tied up. But then more it protected the front of the store from the weather, and weather is like it is here, you know, it's not so hot. Um, and they'd come and they, you know, basically during the day the business was more or less stocking the store, but then at night it was uh, servicing the, the community. 
And I remember the installation of the first, uh, first um, frozen foods, bird's eye. So this was 1947, something like that. Yeah, it's hard to believe, but you know. How'd they keep a refrigerator, just ice blocks? No, they had, they had a freezer at that time. But you know, ice blocks, you know, I keep thinking about this and I said I wasn't gonna mention Chautauqua Lake, but I know I have a picture someplace of uh, horse and buggies harvesting ice. You seen that picture? I want to hook that onto some of these weed harvesters that float around the lake <laughs> to make a point, right? <laughs> anyway, so anyway, the, 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 the point is that, uh, yeah, they used ice for a long time, but then uh, I don't remember ice. I remember ice boxes, but I don't remember ice. I remember, you know, refrigerators and uh, frozen food cabinets. I don't think I remember refrigerators going bad much. Um, but from, you know, I'm 80, so I, you know, and I remember from about 1945 on, so I don't, I don't know when that transition took place. But, yeah, but in the store, another thing that happened around 1948 or so was that they bought three grocery carts. So now suddenly they're becoming self-service, right? So these, I don't know that everybody ever used them. They mainly got potatoes in them when somebody was bringing potatoes from the back to the front. Another story that's sort of interesting, and it's a Jamestown connection, is that um, the way they, well, fruits and vegetables were delivered by a company from here by the name of Donato. Remember Donato? And yep, yep. I don't know where they were located. Maybe down on the inlet. Yeah, we're Jamestown area, certainly. Yeah. Anyway, so they would be brought, and the Donato delivery guy and climber was a big Indians fan. So you'd always talk, and you could always get in a good conversation with him about the Cleveland Indians. But he wasn't a Donato, but he was an Italian guy from here. But other things, you know, flour, sugar, all that sort of stuff, was picked up at the Jamestown Wholesale Grocery. Does that name anything to you? Mm -hmm. That was located on the, it's called the outlet, right? right. And I have surmised, no, I, I never confirmed this with my dad, but I've surmised that that was on the outlet because its deliveries came down lakes, uh, Erie and or no? How did no? They got there somehow. They got there by rail. They got there by rail, so they didn't come by lake. Okay. Yeah. So they got there by rail. In fact, the, the resource center actually owns the building right now. It's just, it's a, then it became a beer distributorship. And, uh, so who's the resource center? Uh, it's it's a big big uh, developmentally di disabled people. They they represent them. Oh, so they're down there now. Yeah, yeah. So dad during the war. Now of course the. And I remember this a little bit. He had a half ton truck, a panel truck, and he had enough gas to get from Clymer to the Jamestown Wholesale. And there was another one down in Brooklyn Square. So there were two wholesales here, that one being the biggest one. And so he'd come, he'd drop me off from my piano lesson at Anna Knowlton's house was 515 East 8th Street. So up there. And I'd have a half hour lesson. He'd go get the groceries, come back and get me, and we'd go back to Climber. That's how he was able to get me here to take piano lessons, was because he was able to get gasoline for the truck that was servicing the, and you know, the truck would be basically loaded with flour and sugar and canned goods and all that sort of stuff. I don't know when the vacuum pack can hit the market. But that was before my time, um, you know. So it's so changed. I mean, it's so incredibly. You know, the basics are still the same, but you know, the the whole method of delivery is so, so changed. So, 1938, you're born. 38, I'm born. Right. And at that time, your dad is owner of a store in in Clymer, New York. So you, that's your corporate knowledge. When you're growing up, is really your dad operating a store? My grandfather and my dad. Okay, yep. and it's important to keep the two together because senior and junior. Uh, yeah, the grandfather had a very important role in my life. 
My dad was the bookkeeper accountant. He was the business side. Grandfather met the business, okay? And I learned an awful lot from the people that worked in that store, him being one, okay? Um, just the simple, simple things like addition and subtraction, which for me became just like that because we didn't have adding machines, okay? At that time, you took a bag or a piece of paper and you added it up on a piece of paper or you did it in your head. And you knew for a fact you were off half the time or whatever, but that was all part and parcel of the business. And at the end of the day, they would total up and they'd look at the receipts and they'd look at the cash in the drawer and they'd decide whether they were short or long, you know. And my grandfather had a fishing you know, one of these fishing lure boxes. I should tie my shoe. But anyway, the, my grandfather had a fishing lure box, and his store was where the Climber restaurant is, and his home was probably 100 yards, maybe a little bit less than that up the street. So he'd take the receipts from the day, and he'd put it in this fishing lure box, and he'd walk up the street with this box. Oftentimes it was dark, and he'd put it in a safe in his house, which was never locked, and he never was robbed that I know of. You know, would we do that today? I can't imagine. Yeah. You know, it, it, uh, my dad always worried about it, and legitimately so, because he was, by that time, he was a pretty old man. So, yeah, and then, you know, so, I was really, and this is a positive statement, I don't mean it in any negative way, I was just basically landlocked in climber. Now, Climber's done pretty well since the 50s and 60s, peak and peak being, you know, very good case in point. Uh, but, you know, it's still small town, still farming community, but there are no farms left. Um, it's, you know, it's, things have changed, but it's still, and it's still my hometown, you know. How did people get from, well, what was the big city in Climber? Was it Jamestown? Jamestown. How would you get normal folks get from James? That was a transportation. No, you drove a car. No, there was a, a railroad that went through Climber, but it was it went from Quarry to Mayville. Now, for instance, my great grandfather, Bruce, my brother, has his. I don't know if he copied this or not, but he has his signature in Mayville when he signed to become a citizen. Okay, now. He came, he was born in 1837, he came to the United States in 1853. So, you know, think about this in the context of the Athenaeum Hotel. As near as I can tell, that was the first business incorporated in Chautauqua County, was the Athenaeum Hotel. And that was 1880, okay? How did they get from Clymer to Mayville for my grandfather to register as a citizen? Had to be trained. So the Clymer, North Clymer, Sherman, Mayville. Um, and those tracks are still there. I mean, the, 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 not the tracks, but the trace of where they are, are still there, and I could take you to them. Yeah. But, um, and then in Mayville, you had the inner urban that came down that side of the lake. I don't know how the, the inner urban also went very close to Sue's house on the other side of the lake, but yeah, that came from side, Westfield. Yeah, I think that one came from Westfield. Well, maybe the original, the other one did too. Um, <coughs> Because Sue talks about, Sue's my wife, talks about getting on the inner urban in Bemis, going to Westfield, taking the train from Westfield to Ithaca, which is where her father was from. Just a sidelight story. Her, her grandfather on her father's side uh, was from a family, well, Sue's father was from a family of five, four girls and him. The youngest girl is still alive. She's 94. She had a home in Paradise, California. You heard this story? She had a home in Paradise, California. Everything destroyed. So we couldn't find her for, I would say, close to a week after the, the news hit about the fire. This year. This year, right? within the last six weeks, yeah, no, no. whenever that was. So, and we'd visit them there, you know, we'd, uh, but at the time that we visited, they owned a house. But by this time, her husband's died, and she's living alone in rental. I don't know whether it was senior citizen housing, but anyway, she's living alone. So 
some number of days after the fire, she calls Sue, tells her that she's okay, she's in Redding, Redding? Chico, I guess Chico. And uh, she'd been staying, they were Seventh-day Adventists, and so she'd been bounced from one home to another in Chico. The next time we talked to her was maybe a week later, uh, and that, so the first time she was in shock. She got out with her purse, her cell phone, and the clothes on her back. Her house survived. Um, so she got down to Chico and then she was Seventh-day Adventist and so she was bounced to three or four homes where she would stay. Then we didn't hear from her. So the second time we talked to her, she was really sad. I'm homeless, I don't know what I'm gonna do, etc. cetera. Now this woman's 94, okay? So, you know, and Sue's not in very good health, so this was one of those things, balancing acts of how do you handle it. Well, what turned out to be the case was that her husband's sister had a daughter, the husband's sister long since dead, any connections to the family long since gone, but a daughter lives in East Texas, someplace out in the boonies, and she gets from, I guess, San Francisco, Northern California, to East Texas, and the daughter is alone on this fairly large farm with two houses, one that had been her father-in-law's, the other that's been her. And so a week ago we talked to her and she now is just totally living the life of Riley with this, she's settled. Now she'll go back to paradise to get, uh, get whatever stuff she can recover. But um, just an amazingly, wow. there was a time she was on the, there was a list of I put her name on, uh, somebody else did too, so her name was twice on the sheriff's lists. Where is this, this woman? And uh, finally we found her, but she found us because the only phone number she had of all of her relatives was Sue's. Wow. So she called and Sue talked to her and then I called her back just to get it all straight. But, uh, so that's Dick Evans' youngest sister. Um, and now she's, Pretty, pretty well off, she's doing pretty well. But just an amazing recovery from yeah. something that is incom you know, incomprehensible, that, that whole fire thing. So anyway, I don't know where we were with that. So no, I'm just curious, as a big city, we talk about Jamestown, how did uh, you get there? Did, was Cory part of your world? I was born in Cory. Okay. So I have uh, a Pennsylvania birth certificate. Why was I born in Cory? Because the doctor in Glamour, now this is another thing that's changed. We had a doctor, and he was God as far as we were concerned. You have something wrong, you go to Doc Williams, he'll fix it. You probably knew his son, Bud. Did you know Bud yeah, Williams? Okay. I didn't know that. Okay, so uh, Doc Williams was just, uh, you know, he, he um, and, and I'm not sure how he ended up in Climber, but he was a graduate of Canisius, and he went, to Clymer as a Catholic. I mean, Clymer was so, the Dutch reformed and the Protestants and the Catholics in the South were just like, like this. So there was a lot of animosity, but Doc Williams was the doctor and he, everybody went to him and he would, he did some things for my family that were just way out of the call. He took my dad to Johns Hopkins one time to deal with something that, his wife or his mother, my mother or his mother was having trouble and they went for a, for a consultation all the way to Baltimore. Wow. Uh, so anyway, Doc Williams was the doctor, but then he only serviced, he only had practicing rights or whatever it was called in the Corey Hospital. So I was born in Corey. My mother was in the hospital with me for 10 days. Mm. Uh, I mean, she's got pictures and stories about well, why did they keep her so long? Who knows? But so by that time, now take it back a generation or maybe two, my great man, grandmother, grandmother was a midwife and she birthed, she birthed Winnie Llewellyn's mother. And I kept telling Winnie about this. <laughs> Winnie would, <laughs> you know, Winnie. Anyway, it was fun. But anyway, so Corey was in the, in, in the mix. And Corey was, but it was Pennsylvania. So the schools didn't mix. So why did we never play Corey in basketball? Because they were in Pennsylvania. Could have, I guess. 
But yeah, it was in the mix, but only. You had to go up over the hill, man. That's an interesting hill. That's Horace Greeley's hill. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I traveled that many times to yeah. Meadville, yeah. Yeah, so that's right, up over the hill. And Greeley is out, you know, west, I guess, quite a ways. And this is another thing that's interesting. So I have a high school classmate. He didn't graduate. But he lives, so you go up over the hill and down to Cory. If you go into Cutting, and if you stay in the road, if, you, if instead of turning left at the top of the hill, and the top of the hill has, the house there has an interesting story. So you turn left at the top of the hill, and you go to Cory. But if you go straight and keep going over the Cutting Road, you're on the so-called State Line Road. Mm -hmm. And that's where the Greeley family west of the cutting road lived. Yeah. I had a high school, have a high school classmate who still lives out there and he went to climber school. Now 10 miles, 12 miles, 14 miles, I don't know, quite a ways. Uh, his name was Wallace and he became a very successful, uh, um, well I guess herdsman, I don't know what you call it, but he raised Holstein cattle and became very successful in the next generation of that. So the top of the hill turned left to go to Cory. Top of the hill, there's a house, and that house was owned when I was a student by a man by the name of Wilbur Camp. And Camp had three or four daughters, the youngest of whom was in my high school class, okay? Now I hadn't caught up with her in years, but um, being around climbers, she would come back in the summertime. She worked here. She worked at WCA here for a while. She was a nurse. But she moved to Florida and started the first hospice, the first one in Tampa, Florida. Now, think about that. I mean, that's another entrepreneurial story in yeah. climber. Now, this is like 1978, when, or 78 or 80, when, you know, nobody would heard of something. So I'm really proud of her for that, you know. And she uh, provides advice for me now because Sue is disabled, you know. And another thing, if you haven't thought about it, if you don't have home care insurance, if you don't have long-term care insurance, get it. <laughs> uh, because it, it adds up in a hurry. So anyway, um, but uh, so that's, and then we used to ride our bicycles. It was a big deal to get on the bicycle in the morning and go to Cory, go to the movie and ride back. It was great because you could come down that fast hill coming back. Not so good going up. Uh, so how uh, far is that? Seven miles. Seven miles. Yeah. And, uh, and Corey was an interesting. I don't know what's there now. I haven't been there in years. So are there any? Not much. So the businesses are gone, all of them? A couple of them are there that are doing Corey contractors and been doing well. Uh, there's a steel company that's still doing okay. You know, I hear these ads on television, or I guess on the radio. And there are ads for companies that help successful companies take, develop second lines of business. You ever heard those ads? So, okay, well, let's stop and think about it. So, why do you need a second line of business? I'm selling silver halide photography. Oh, yeah? Eastman Kodak is now $1.10 a share, $1.15. Polaroid's gone, right? Who would have thought 20 years ago? that a company is stable and as sound and as successful as Kodak could ever go out of business. Yeah. And Polaroid, you know, I've got a picture of the vice president for research at Polaroid when he was at Chautauqua holding a Polaroid camera in front of Webb's, right? And we were talking about the history of Polaroid film. You remember the first Polaroid you saw? 50s or something like that? I saw one, yeah, okay, it was, uh, there was a, a woman whose daughter was um, a cheerleader for Chautauqua High School, I think, or maybe Mayville. And she had a, when I was in the eighth grade, she had a Polaroid. So that would have been 52, 53, okay. Polaroid land, you know, incredible inventor, but he only wanted to produce color photographs. There were all sorts of inventions around his company that became huge, which he ignored, sure. and he went out of business. So I have a friend, so how does this, uh, how does this uh, carry the present day? I have a friend who runs a diaper factory. Now my friend makes adult diapers, huge business. 
every Medicaid patient in a nursing home in Michigan, if they need it, gets a case of his diapers a month, okay? Now, you don't have to be a you know, rocket scientist to figure out that's a pretty good business, right? So I said to him, Chuck, you know, you got great product. What happens if somebody discovers ways to make it biodegradable? What happens if somebody says, we're not gonna put that crap in landfills anymore, we're gonna let light degrade it, or we're gonna let the bugs degrade it, we're, you know? You're out of business. Don't you think you ought to take some of this largesse you're getting from the tax reduction of C corporations in 2017 or 18 and spend that on research and development at your company? Mm -hmm. Right? Logical, right? Oh yeah, we should do that. But then he doesn't know how to translate that into the next generation of information. So <coughs> even though <coughs> the situation is presented to him, he doesn't know how to go out and hire the right kind of people to get people that can translate that into reality. Right. Oh, it's so important, I'll buy it from the Chinese. Well, I, that's, you know, that's an American mentality about business which doesn't always compute, sure didn't compute for Kodak. Right. Uh, so, you know, these are sort of interesting digressions, but they fit the philosophy, which says you gotta be one step ahead all the time. Anyway, so Corey was in the picture, uh, but I don't know anything about it now. What about your dad? My dad was a musician, and... Uh, um, Where did he get that from? Where yeah. in the family would... Well, that's an interesting question. I think his mother was interested in music, but yeah, and I, I don't know. My dad, my dad was a musician, and uh, so I started taking lessons very early. Think what about kind it. Of right? musician, piano? Organ. organ. He played the pipe organ. And so, well, of course, and he directed the choir at First Methodist Church here. Mm. Sang at this, isn't there a uh, Christian Science Church across the street? He used to be a soloist over there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, my dad was an interesting guy. He, uh, he graduated from Hope in 1935, right like in the High School? I, yeah, and it was Clymer High School at the time. That's an interesting comment because it was Clymer High School, then it became Clymer Central School. And that was when they brought in Finley Lake and as I said, they went all the way almost to Wattsburg. So they almost went to the Pennsylvania corner on the west and on the south and then all around. So Finley Lake students were in my class, uh, probably 20% of the students were educated at what was a Finley Lake school, right? So dad went to school, graduated in 1930, took a year and then went to Hope in 1931, majored in music. He has, he always talked about this, and this is interesting because he had a Bachelor of Music degree. Now, I don't know if you knew much about the, uh, about the, academic environment at Allegheny. But the academic environment in liberal arts colleges is to protect with all your forces the notion that this is a liberal arts college. Which means you don't want to specialize. You want to have a start, you know, sort of you have a degree in history, right? Or political economics. economics, right? And you don't want to produce econ economists very much. You want to produce guys that can become Economist in her next life, right? So Hope was, when I taught there, was that way. Very, and I really appreciate this, by the way. As a scientist, I really appreciate the liberal arts part of it. But when my dad was there, they gave him a Bachelor of Music degree. Ooh. In other words, he took enough courses in music, so he has a Bachelor of Music degree from Hope College. And there was also- oh, again, just, yeah. you, you mentioned Hope a lot. Yeah. Uh, what's the Dutch connection to Hope, and why would people from Clymer who are Dutch people end up at Hope? You don't know that? No. It's church. Okay. So, okay, so here, here's, here's how this all goes. Um, so there was this major immigration from the Netherlands in the 1830s, 40s, 50s. It didn't start in the 30s, it started in the 40s, and I think that was at the time when steamships I don't know whether they were, you know, I think that's the, sort of at the time 
when one got from Rotterdam to New York with a steamer instead of a four-master or whatever. I sort of traced that, but not very carefully. But anyway, so what happened with uh, these groups was that they'd be directed from, and so there was this community in Albany and community in New York City. Some of the best property in New York City is owned by the Dutch Reformed Church. It's at right next to Wall Street. I mean, it's it's a church that they've owned, and they've got land around it, so it's a very wealthy area. Marble Collegiate, it's called, and it's where the Nixon girls were married. Okay, so church, Dutch Reformed Church, um, and then this group, the first group, went to Holland, Michigan, and they got there via Detroit, and they got there cross land. So they went to Detroit, and then I don't know, there was no Lake Michigan involved. They didn't come up around and down the lake. They sort of got over there. I don't know if that's right. But anyway, they ended up in Holland, which is a port city on the western part of the state. And they really conquered that area. So they settled in with, and these were people, now this is interesting too, because we can sort of talk about the Northwest Iowa group and the Holland, Michigan group and the Clamor, New York group. So the people at the people that ended up in Western Michigan were all religious refugees. Mm -hmm. So they were brought by, um, and this is interesting for Chautauqua County in some respects, they were brought by uh, a leader whose name was Van Ralty, okay? And Van Ralty was a preacher who was disaffected by the Reformed Church in the Netherlands because he was too radical. So he was the seventh or eighth generation educated in his family, and he went to Leiden, I think. I don't remember for sure. It's, I, could have to, I can go back and look, but Leiden got his degree and then finished, and he wanted to be ordained into the Dutch Reformed Church. And there was this crossover between state and church, and you know rebels were coming all over the place at that time. This was just a few years after Napoleon. Mm -hmm. So there was rebellion in the church in the Netherlands. And some of these guys were so rebellious that they wouldn't ordain them. So they went ahead and started preaching around the Netherlands anyway. Mm -hmm. And this guy, Van Ralty, ended up in the town of Arnhem. Uh, you ever see the movie A Bridge Too Far? So that's Arnhem. Right. Arnhem is the capital of Helderland, which is where my family's from. Uh. Winterswijk is two hours southeast of Arnhem, but Arnhem is, you know, where all the records are, okay? So he ends up in Arnhem, and finally he decides he can't handle it anymore, he's gonna leave. So he gets a group of 50 people, 55, and they head for the United States. This is 1847. Now, they spend the winter in Detroit, and he then goes across state. And what I don't remember and maybe don't even know is whether they went up around through the Sioux Locks and down into Lake Michigan to get from Detroit to Western Michigan or not. I don't know. But so 1847, 1848, this group of some number, 55 or 60, gets in Western Michigan. And they start, he now is a preacher, and my grandfather, my great-grandfather on my mother's side was married by Albertus Van Ralty. She was from Holland, Michigan. So, okay, so uh, get in Holland, Michigan and start schools. And this is 1847, 1848. By 1862, they have started a college. And that college is called Hope Academy or Hope whatever. And there are 11 or 12 students, maybe a few more, but not many more, a few students that enroll in the first class in the fall of 1862, one of whom is a twinkle, T-winkle, from Clymer, okay? So he, and his, I just have had some conversations with a good friend of mine, Lynn Jacobs, you probably know her, she's been here. Yeah. They just gave some money here. And Lynn Jacobs, you know, is, she, uh, she wrote something, she, she claimed in a, in a letter to the editor in the paper that uh, the pen is mightier than the sword, and she dated that back to 1870 or so in English. Well, this guy Twinkle gave a speech in Dutch, the pen is mightier than the sword. When he graduated in 1866, 
at Hope, so she didn't have it right. So I pointed that, that but anyway. But so it started then, and, and it became very, uh, so, and, and the history of, of what was going on in higher education at this time is really interesting. First there were Harvard and Yale and whatever else, but then other places. So a place that was very significant in higher education was Union College, which is where I think the New York Law School was at Union to begin with, wasn't it? So Union was very significant. And so um, it's now Union University, but at that time it was Union College. And a man whose name was Phelps, whose father was the treasurer or whatever another word is for treasurer of the state of New York for many years. Comptroller. Comptroller. He was for like 40 years comptroller of the state of New York. His son was Phi Beta, Phi Beta Kappa graduate from Union, got a degree, PhD from maybe Yale. And he had the curriculum of what universities and colleges did at that time just down. So he became the successful successor of the guy that started what was Hope College. And they had a board of trustees, I don't know what they called them, so they were, they were um, founded in 1866 effectively, and that was when their first class graduated. One of the persons that was on their first board was Schuyler Colfax. Uh, Vice President, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and before he was pitched because of uh, and one of the things I keep threatening to my should talk with Lake friends is that, you know, I think that most of the uh, most of the weeds that are in should talk with Lake off places like should talk with institution are legacy weeds. They come from fertilization that went on in the 1870s and 80s and 90s. So I'm going to get John Hyle Vincent's DNA and we're going to clone him off the bottom of should talk with Lake. And I threatened that to Borello, you know, that guy, you know. And oh, Thomas Edison too, or U.S. Grant. We, you know, probably all pooped in the lake. <laughs> we <get that. laughs> anyway, so so they ended up in Western Michigan, and then they had a very strong relationship to the church. So um, they had a theological school and almost nothing else. So they taught things, but you know, but Phelps set up this curriculum that looks like. You know, a curriculum that at the University of Kansas or a curriculum. Allegheny was earlier and Bucknell was earlier than Allegheny. So these places, both of which I've gotten their, their original curriculums from, had those curricula. But when they got from Eastern New York to Western Michigan and Kansas, you know, they were new, they were dropped in. So they had an academic curriculum. And they taught physics and chemistry. And what they did was say what the books were that they used in these courses. So Phelps wrote the first curriculum for Hope College. And he had, you know, he said, well, look, you know, we gotta support ourselves. So he bought some farmland. And, or maybe he, I don't know if he bought it, but he got some farmland. He was gonna set up a farm and that was going to produce the food that was eaten in the dormitories. He built a building um, and he um, was just very aggressive. But he got crosswise in, in a couple ways. One way he got crosswise was with the theological guys who were always fighting and still are. This is the Betsy DeVos versus everybody else group still today, okay? Betsy DeVos is from the side that I'm not from, okay? Even though she lives in the same area and she inherited her money because whatever, Bottom line is they're from one side of this Dutch connection and I'm from the other side. And they fought. And that was going on in the 1860s. If you talk to Don Lubbers, Don Lubbers was the president for years of Grand Valley State College in, in, in Western Michigan, near Grand Rapids. And you know, say these guys have been fighting forever. If they'd have quit fighting, we'd have had a big university here. Well, he built a big university in Grand Valley. Hope could have been that big university, but the preacher guys didn't get along. So anyway, so in 1878 or so, they, Phelps is this great aggressive guy who's gonna bring academic excellence. He's gonna produce a university and he's gonna fund all of this by the farm crops that he grows but he forgot to check that the farms out there are mostly out of sand soil. So you don't grow much in sand. So anyway, you have one drought and your crop's gone. Your crop, your crop is gone and that's what happened. So then guys on the west coast, on the east coast, Van Ostrand, 
you know, famous publisher, and others go out to Western Michigan, they say, guys, you know, we gotta get rid of this guy, we gotta close it down, we gotta make sure it balances its budget. And how we're gonna do this, we're gonna split the theological guys off, and we'll put them over here and we'll put them in a seminary, and we'll call that Western Seminary. Why is it Western Seminary? Well, it's West relative to Rutgers, yeah, yeah. okay? So there is a Dutch Reform, a Reformed Church in America seminary there. And you may know some people at, do you ever hear the name Hesslink at, uh, at, uh, I know Terry Hesslink here locally. Well, he, but anyway, Hesslink was a professor there who was at Chautauqua for a number of years. I don't know, uh, anyway, he has to have a winter spike connection, anything with INK does. But so, but, so they split off and the school then sort of bounces along for a while. Now, very interestingly, I discovered while doing all this stuff that the very first PhD graduate in chemistry at the University of Illinois went to Hope College as an undergraduate. His name was William Morris Dane, D-E-H-N, and he graduated in about 1896. And then he went to Illinois, he finished his PhD in, eight, in about 1900, and he worked on organic compounds of arsenic, okay? A recent book, and I've forgotten the actual title of the book, by an author who writes often about chemical weapons for the New York Times, his name is Teo Emery, uh, tells me that in the first place, Dane was the first PhD at the University of Illinois in 1900, and he, uh, he then gets a teaching job at the University of Washington in Seattle. Now this is 1900, so this is you know really out in the West. But 1914 comes along, and there is this initiative, I didn't bring the book with me, it's in my other car, but there is this initiative to, um, Germans are using, or by 1915 they were using chlorine, we gotta get busy, we gotta have a chemical warfare group. You saw my little note to uh, Hopper, right? Yeah, yeah. The story there is that they, in, at something called Catholic University in, in Washington, set up laboratories, and they had arsenic all over the place. <coughs> and why did they have arsenic? Because they needed to get poisons that they could spray around. So the first thing they did is they went to every academic, and now the people that are they, James Bryant Conant, James Flack Norris from MIT, Vannevar Bush was involved at some level. They went around the country and they asked chemists for all those things that were poisonous to send them samples. So this guy, William Morris Dane, who's now at Washington University in Washington, Seattle, Seattle, Washington, sends them 100 pounds of a compound of mercury that's extremely toxic. And I said, well, I know this guy, Dane, he misspelled the, the, the uh, Emory had misspelled his name, and so I had conversations back with him. But this is the Hope graduate, who was the first person to contribute to the chemical warfare effort in 1914. What happened after that was that these guys had built laboratories, and I think probably a thousand people worked at those laboratories. And it's still under discussion because the area that they worked, and this is the message to Hopper, and he knows it, is that this area of the, of the district is filled with arsenic poisons at this point. And so all those properties that are so valuable, you know, aren't valuable at all because chemical weapons were made there in 1914, 1915. And what they did was they took, now this, this, and I'm not making this stuff up, this is true. So there was a thesis from uh, same Catholic University in 1905 by a father, Julius Newland. You know who Julius Newland is? Mm -hmm. He was New Rockney's chemistry teacher okay. at, at Notre Dame. I heard the name, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, so Newland wrote a thesis and what he did was he took acetylene and he added it to everything. And one of the things he added it to was arsenic trichloride and he ended up spending a month in the hospital because the compounds that he made were derivatives of arsenic trichloride and acetylene. And out of this came, when they purified it, one compound which was the monoacetylene derivative of arsenic trichloride, monochloral, uh, monochloral vinyl arsine. 
And monochloral vinyl arsine, toxic as the devil, they synthesized it and they purified it and they turned it into a deliverable weapon. And it has a name, it's called Lewisite. Lewisite is called dew of death and later it never got used. But they made it and where they make it, there was just, and, and Emery told him himself, I said, there's got to be arsenic with this, you know. He said, oh, there's arsenic all over because they just buried this stuff when they were done with it in Washington, D.C. And now guys want to buy that property and the first thing you had to do is get a chemical analysis 10 feet deep <laughs> of where their basement's going to be. So anyway, that's the needle of Hopper. I've had that conversation yeah, with him yeah. before. Okay, so bottom line is, so they have lewisite. They've made it and they've purified it. This is now late 1917. What do they do next? Well, there was an old automobile plant at the end of the trolley line in Cleveland. Willoughby. Willoughby. You know about this? You mentioned it one time. I'm just getting this together. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Willoughby. Why, why was Cleveland important? Because that carborundum was there and that's where they made the carbon for gas masks. Okay? Yeah. And in a book that I have about World War II, there's a whole series of, you know, maybe 50 pages of chemical research leading to better gas masks. World War II now, not World War II. So anyway, 1917. So what happens? They want to make it. Where are they going to make it? Well, someplace which isn't close to anything but not far away, and that becomes Willoughby. Yeah. And the site is called Ben-Hur. So the Ben-Hur automobile site in Willoughby. I've been there, okay? It's right along the road between here and Perrysburg. And who do they send to start the factory? Well, their best chemist, who happened to be James Bryant Conant. So Conant finished his PhD at Harvard in 1913 or 14. He had two research directors. His research directors were an organic chemist by the name of Kohler and the first Nobel laureate in chemistry by the name of T.H. Richards, American Nobel laureate, who was a professor at Harvard, did some things on atomic weights. Richards' daughter married Conan. So, okay, Conan's the guy, he's really smart. Everybody recognizes he's really smart. He's a good organic chemist. So they send him to Willoughby and he then synthesizes in quantity. And we don't know what the quantity is, Emory doesn't. I don't, but some large number of tons of monochloral vinyl arsine. They put it on a train at night and whatever else, ship it to what becomes Baltimore Harbor, start to get it to France, and then the war ends, gets out in the lake and they ship, they sink it in off, uh, off Baltimore Harbor. It's not, in, uh, it's not in Chesapeake, it was out in the ocean. But we don't know. I mean, the whole thing gets lost in how much it was. But the site has been cleaned up. Unlike Washington, which has got arsenic all over, the site in Willoughby doesn't have much. Yeah. So, so back to your, but your dad, yeah. was it just logical then, if you were of the religion, the uh, reformed religion, that you would think about going to a liberal arts school at Hope? Yeah, and that's, that's, that's absolutely what one, one would think about, right? your dad uh, yeah. and just as symbolic of yeah. uh, people from the climber area and how they would find themselves going to yeah. a liberal arts school and a liberal arts education and hope seemed to be the go-to place. That was Dutch Reformed Church and that was all entitled, you know, that was all my grandfather went there when it was he went to a high school there and it was it was the Reformed Church, it was the Dutch Church and the Dutch were pretty clannish and it all sort of uh, it all sort of came together. So as a boy, um, I mean, there was never any question about going to college. It was a question of, and it, to me it was, I was just ba basically preordained that I would go to Hope College. Right. But um, those were days in which interesting things were happening in the country. It was, you know, we don't give Dwight Eisenhower enough credit, I don't think. But Eisenhower was a pretty significant president. He started the interstate highway system and he, had a, he and Churchill both, after the war, spoke with a great, Churchill gave a speech at, you know, we hear about, about uh, the, the uh, Iron Curtain speech in, in Missouri, Fulton, Missouri, but he gave a speech at MIT which said the English system was just uh, fraught with mistakes when it came to science and engineering, mm -hmm. okay? 
And uh, I don't know that it's changed much, but it's certainly better than it was at that time. And Eisenhower recognized that here too. So he pushed, when I was a high school student, maybe you remember it too, but when I was a high school student, there was a strong initiative for science and engineering. And um, that, that impacted me. You know, I heard that. Um, I was also a student that really, <coughs> I, I've thought about this a lot. The places where I really had the best luck as a student was when people left me alone and I studied on my own. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I could have gotten through high school much more quickly than I did if I, you know, but I was in a fairly rigid, and nothing wrong with that. I had to grow up, you know, and all that sort of stuff. But, but so I thought about that. And then uh, it, it was just, it was at a time when science and engineering was interesting. My uncle was a scientist and I thought, well, I ought to look at engineering. And Hope didn't have a college, it didn't have engineering, it does now, but it didn't then. So I started looking around and I was a football fanatic in some ways. And we would always get the scores from the East first. So it was radio, we didn't have television. So on the radio, I don't know what station, maybe WJTN. I don't know if we got WJTN in the afternoons on Saturdays or not, because it, in Climber, by the end of six o'clock, WJTN was gone because they turned their transmitter down. But anyway, so we, the scores would come from the east. You'd hear Cornell and Dartmouth, and then these three schools in Pennsylvania, Bucknell, Lehigh, and Lafayette. So I said, that sounded interesting. So I looked at Lafayette, and I thought, well, that's sort of an interesting place. And I thought, well, there's Lehigh, and then there's Bucknell. Well, Lafayette and Lehigh were both engineering schools and good ones, but they were all male at the time. Bucknell was, and my dad, you know, said, you know, I don't care, but you need to go to a co-educational school. So, I mean, these are all transitions that happened over a period of time, you know, and so, I applied at all those schools, applied at Cornell, applied at, you know, and um, went to Bucknell and I thought this is kind of interesting, but it wasn't hope. So and that was important to me at the time. I needed to break because I was independent and I wanted to be away from, and my cousin Nancy, who was my Uncle Jim's daughter, only daughter to survive, did the same thing. We wanted to break away from that Dutch Reformed rigidity is, you know, that's not quite fair, but it was awfully strict. And that was part of what was going on in my mind. So I went to those, looked at those schools, um, have looked at them since because I've given lectures at all those places. But I went to Bucknell. And that was the most important, I made that decision myself. And that was the most important decision of my life for a long time because I was on my own. If I made it, okay. If I didn't, okay, but it would be my fault. So I concentrated very hard at Bucknell, and I was, you know, it, but it was a good school. I mean, I have to, we saw the Bucknell Ohio State basketball game about a month ago, and it's still a really good school. They almost beat them, you know, in Columbus. Uh, but. And it was a good school. I had good teachers. The students around me, I you know, didn't recognize. Ken Longoni was, you know, a couple of classes ahead of me, the guy that started Home Depot. I didn't know him, but he was there. And the guy that I sort of knew really well was David Sayre. He's the guy that runs around the country giving the publisher clearinghouse checks away. Yeah. Uh, he's still doing it. And then a friend, Bob Howell. I knew Nancy Dalrymple because she lived in Warren. And we, there was a guy here by the name of Roger something or other that had a car. And Bucknell is in the middle of nowhere, I gotta tell you. And getting from there here, I hitchhiked periodically. Can you believe that? Yeah. Did you ever hitchhike? Absolutely. <laughs> and a baby, you know, and I did that, you know. So anyway, so, but I had really good teachers. And uh, not so much in, in the sciences, even though I was a chemistry, well, I was a chemical engineer first, but then I was a chemistry major. But some of the people I had in the humanities, they were really good. My first English teacher was exceptionally good at Bucknell. And I had studied two, uh, took a political science course with a guy named Gathings. You ever heard that name? Gathings wrote a thesis in 1939 on international intellectual property law, and this was right after, you know, 
reparations and all those things that went on with the Alien Property Act of 1917. It's, it's one of the Bibles in the field. And I had that guy from, you know, nobody knew his research, but he was a really exceptional teacher. And one of the things he made us all do was read the New York Times. Never stopped reading the New York Times. Um, and he was just very good because, and I never got to know him. I barely, you know, I took his class and whatever I got, I got. But, you know, and then the English teacher was just tough. You know, that stuff's garbage. We'll throw it in the waste basket and start over again. And those were all really good, you know. And then math and chemistry, that was just part of it. And nothing particularly exceptional. So then soon I met here. And I was under whether I really thought I was, whether I really was or not, I felt I was under pressure to go to Hope. So I transferred to Hope. So I transferred there as a junior, and they had a really good chemistry department, a really exceptionally good chemistry department. Still, I mean, it was, and so, uh, and that was a really important experience too, because at Bucknell, everything was structured. Took a chemistry lab, everything was planned out for you. You can't make any mistakes, uh, you know. If you make a mistake, you may get a low grade in that particular experiment, but you don't learn from it. At Hope, no structure. So the laboratories were basically open. So I could work in the laboratory at any or all times of the day or night. Not safely, was stupid, but boy, I learned from that. Yeah. And I learned that, you know, maybe making a mistake would teach you about something you didn't know. And I learned the thrill of finding out things that I was the only person in the world to know. Whether it was important or not, I learned the thrill of making something mine that happened in the laboratory. And so that was a really important part of it. And then there were three exceptionally good students in the class ahead of me at Hope. I mean, exceptionally good students that eventually all got PhDs. They were all Phi Beta Kappas, or would have been, because Hope didn't have a Phi Beta Kappa, but they were all summa cum laude graduates. So I, I went to Hope, and then I finished there. We got married, and I went to Kansas, and I'll come back to that. But then the Bucknell story goes this way, and that is, so I went to Kansas, I got my degree, everything sort of went pretty smoothly. So I'll come back to Kansas, okay. but the most important thing that I want to say here is that, so I, I finished at Kansas in record time still. And those things happened because everything sort of, and I made a couple of discoveries that were able to be developed, so my thesis went together pretty quickly. And the, the way chemists operate, I'm an organic chemist, and the way chemists operate is that you're, you select a mentor, an advisor, and he usually or she usually presents a, a case for you to study. And then you start down that pathway. But really good students are encouraged to spring out from that. And really good professors are those that allow others to develop their, their uh, own projects and their own skills. And that's what happened to me. And so I made a couple of discoveries that were really significant. And I didn't realize they were significant at the time, but as time went on, they became even more significant. So, and that's what led to my consulting career and eventually led to 3D printing. But it was, it was at that time. So anyway, I finished at Kansas. And exactly to the date, seven years, so what degree did you get at Kansas? I got a PhD. PhD. Okay, and it's typical in chemistry. Some people get master's degrees, but I did not. So you, I could have written them. All I had to do was simply apply for a master's degree and could have gotten it, because all of the requirements were pretty much the same. So um, I finished my PhD, and um, my brother Bruce came out for the to help us move back here. And I was driving, you know, my uncle had a PhD in chemistry. And I thought, well, this is pretty tough going. You know, if he could do it, maybe I can do it too, I don't know. And so I did it 
fairly quickly and so on and so forth. But then I'd been driving toward a PhD for so long. Suddenly I got the degree and I remember the feeling driving down the Kansas Turnpike going from Lawrence East. We came back here and, you know, drove and uh, pulled a U-Haul and all that sort of stuff. Came back here and I thought, no, driving east. So I got this degree, what the heck am I gonna do with it? And that's literally what I thought. I don't know what, I was on the way to Harvard, you know? <laughs> and so, I, and so literally seven days, seven years to the day from when I enrolled at Bucknell, I walked into the laboratory at Harvard and the Harvard laboratory had more students in it than my high school graduating class, okay? Uh, I was too dumb to know that that was sort of challenging. <laughs> it, was, it was a fun experience. So anyway, but the thing I want to bring up about Bucknell was that there was a student from the class ahead of me at Bucknell, chemistry student, who uh, was in the Harvard laboratory. And I've had a chance to think about comparing her abilities and her successes to those three guys that I knew so well at Hope as undergraduates. And those guys just run circles around. You know, the, and this didn't have anything to do with the girl, it didn't have anything to do with, it's just that they had incredible abilities and became incredible scientists as time went on. So, you know, that was, and then I was at Harvard when John Kennedy was shot. And uh, a lot of things happened on the day John Kennedy was shot. I was supposed to give a seminar, it was on a Friday. I was supposed to give a seminar at, at Harvard and uh, about Wednesday my professor came by and said he was a student of Conant's. So my professor was one of Conant's last PhD students before Conant became president of Harvard. And so my, my academic family tree there goes from Bartlett to, to Conant. Anyway, so uh, he came to me and he said, you know, I'm sorry, but this Friday is going to be taken by somebody else. We finally got enrolled Hoffman to uh, speak at uh, one of these physical organic seminars. And Roald Hoffman was a, a junior fellow. So junior fellows were selected by Harvard. You know, this was one of Conant, as the president, one of Conant's ideas. You find the best students that are at Harvard and you give them a special appointment, then they'll become your faculty members. And so he was one of those. I was just a mere fellow. He was a junior fellow. And so he gave the seminar and this was about four o'clock and Kennedy was assassinated at 1.30. Mm -hmm. And so, I didn't see him after that. I mean, he was around, but he didn't work for our, our, in our labs. But the next time I saw him was uh, on the concert hall in Stockholm when I was invited by photopolymer chemists at that time to be in Stockholm at the time the Nobel ceremonies were given. And he won the Nobel Prize that year. So I was at the ceremony and we talked about <laughs> the assassination of Kennedy. Uh, which was awful for those of us that were alive at the time. You know, I'm sure you were at the time. And it was more than that. It was just so, and at Harvard was just so, there was something in the air there. It was just one of those places that you couldn't get away from all the history. And uh, so anyway, so I went to Hope and that worked out really well. Then I went to Kansas and I liked, that worked out really well. But my dad's influence on this was you know, he was just pointing me toward a college education from the day I can remember. My mother too. My mother was from Holland. She had an honor. She had a degree from Hope, and and uh, so it was just in the blood. So, anyway, let me just pause for a second because yeah. uh, we might want to pause for a second and pick this up, kind of. And then your academics are over. You're ready to launch, and. Um, I know you've got a long day and you got to yeah. get ahead of you, but we might want to take a break and pick this up and kind of call it a day right now. I think that's wise because I'm getting sort of tired. My, but the, the uh, I want to really, one of the things I'm thinking about in my autobiography is it's not my autobiography. It's just I want to write, I want to be philosophical about it. I have some very strong feelings about higher education. I have some very strong feelings about the liberal arts in higher education. I don't remember a thing. Well, that's maybe not true. But of all the chemistry courses that I took, 
as an undergraduate student. I remember almost nothing. But those courses that I spoke about at Bucknell and the history course I took at Hope, those are the places that set me on paths toward lifelong learning. You know, and if ever there was a message about the liberal arts kind of undergraduate degree, it isn't that it's pre-professional in any way. It isn't that, oh, they're good at being accountants when they get done with an undergraduate degree in history. It is that it carries with it a desire to learn that, you know, you can focus wherever you want to focus, but the desire to learn is one of those things you can't lose that the liberal arts college presents. And uh, I worry about a lot of things about higher education, but one of the things I worry about is that, and I, I have here, I'll send it to you, the Board of Trustees approval of our PhD program in the photochemical sciences at Bowling Green, 1987. And what I told them in 1987 is precisely what turned out to be the case 20 years later, mm -hmm. okay? I didn't have any idea that we were gonna basically replace silver halide photography with the stuff that we were doing and other people were doing, didn't have any idea. But that's what happened. And so scientifically it meant that, that higher education gave opportunities and those higher education opportunities led to products that were important. But on the other side, the liberal arts side, I just think that there's nothing, you know, you have the same same experience that your, your college education led to it and whatever. You probably had the curiosity before. I certainly did. But the curiosity was disciplined by Bob Sedig and, and, and others who guided you. And that same thing with me. Uh, to places where we hadn't ever gone before. And uh, we're missing that in some respects. Mm -hmm. Although I watched the, you know, I watched some of my, my son's friends and daughter's friends, and they have it. But, you know, they didn't go to public universities, a lot of them. So, anyway, but I want to, that's sort of what I saw, and I'm tired. I think we need to sort of bag it. Mm -hmm.